welcome to the finest of London. And our guest today is the property legend, is a founder of Bishop Estates here in London, Gary Hersham. Hello, Gary. So good to have you on the show. Diana, thank you very much for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Gary, and you found Beecham Estates nearly 40 years ago. Tell me, how has the property market has changed since then in the United Kingdom? Um, Diana, I founded Beecham Estates, as you say, about 40 years ago. And that was in the mid 70s, 77 or 78. I can't quite remember when it was. And the market was pretty balanced and pretty stable in the early days. To give you a little example, you could buy a beautiful one bedroom, one reception room flat overlooking Primrose Hill in St. John's Wood and a flat that had was a corner flat where you had windows in both directions looking over Primrose Hill and you'd get change from 15,000 pounds. Really? That flat today, for example, is worth no less than 1.7 million pounds. It's incredible. Late 70s and early 80s, price, prices didn't really escalate very much. And all of a sudden, and for example, round the corner from Primrose Hill was a road called Avenue Road. Yes. Avenue Road in Northwest 8, and today is the premier road in St. John's Wood. The most expensive house we have sold in Avenue Road in the last few years has been 41 or 42 million pounds. At the time that we're to, and of course, recently, we just rented a house, rented a house for two million pounds a year. So if you go back to the, if you go back to the early eighties, a million pounds was unheard of. If you had a bid of your, on your house of a million pounds on Avenue Road, you grabbed it. All of a sudden, things exploded. The market changed. And if you go to the period of time where um, a new block of flats in Knightsbridge was, re was developed on an existing site, 1,500 pound a square foot, 1,200 pound a square foot was the highest of the high. Today, if you look at prime residential in prime central London, you could be talking of seven thousand pound a square foot, and if you weren't that, if you were more conservative, five or five and a half thousand pound a square foot. And there have been quite uh, examples of flats being sold at over eight thousand pounds a square foot. So look at the comparison in the mid eighties, a thousand to twelve hundred, maybe a thousand to fifteen hundred, and all of a sudden prices changed dramatically. Who was the who, who were the instigators, the real instigators of the highest price per square foot? It was none other than Chris and Nick Candy, who started developing in Belgrave Square in, in, in the 80s, in the late 80s. And then eventually, as we know, started construction of and put up number one Hyde Park. Number one Hyde Park broke all records. All of a sudden you were getting four and a half and five thousand pounds a square foot for residential units, albeit in a building that's incomparable to anything else in prime central London, but nearly three and a half or four times more than the highest prices ever achieved. So the market went up exponentially in London in those days. So coming back to your question, what changes have I seen in prime central London? Well, the biggest change is the price shift and how the price has shifted over the years. The second biggest change is that there's been a huge increase in number of foreign purchases from third world countries to countries from behind the Russian, the, behind the Iron Curtain to Chinese who are now buying and have been buying for years prime residential property in prime central London without any price limits. Let me just explain my view on that. And that is, if you go back to the 80s, to the mid 80s, mid 70s to mid 80s, what was wealth in those days? If a man was worth 10 or 20 million pounds in England, chairman of a public company, he was worth 10 or 20 or maybe 30 million pounds, he was phenomenally wealthy. And quite frankly, if you go back into those days, I doubt you can find many people worth 100 million pounds. 
So the, so the level of money and the level of wealth as compared to the purchase price of property had some form of comparison. Today, when you look at the super wealthy, you look at what people call oligarchs, you're talking in billions, not in tens or hundreds of millions. And things have changed completely. We sold a house recently in Rutland Gate to a very wealthy individual, paid 210 million pounds for it. Questions were asked by people who I know, wealthy people as well, saying, is he mad? How could he spend 210 million pounds on a house? Well, I think you have to put yourself in the shoes of the person who bought it. Phenomenally wealthy, worth a huge amount of money and bought 60,000 square feet. But I don't think people really focus on the two connecting factors. One is indiv the individual's wealth and one is the purchase price. So, as I say, the two main changes have been the shift in nationalities and the prices achieved. And are you still busy in prime central London? Do you have a lot of sales going on right now? I would say that we've had um, an extraordinary year um, in terms of COVID being ravaged in, in, uh, in the world. At the beginning of 2020 in March, as I said, we sold the house for 210 million. During the course of the year, we sold at least four, three or four units between 25 and 60 million pounds. And mainly out of the blue. So what does it tell you? We sold a house in the country for just under 22 million pounds quite recently. I think it was in December. It's, it's it tells that people yeah. still believe property has a, a, a solid value. And even more so, they believe that United Kingdom, England, um, is a very, very safe haven. You so yes, it's very active. Very it's, active. Very it's good to hear, it's so positive. Um, so you specialize in prime and super prime uh, residential, but I also know that you, you were uh, involved in the sale and acquisitions of sites. Oh, no. Is it still profitable to buy land and build residential developments on it? Your quest, the question you ask, is it still profitable to buy residential land, develop and make a profit out of it? The answer is very simple. The art is in the buying. It really depends on what price you pay for the land. You have to be either assured or sure of what you're going to be able to develop, or if not, and you're buying a site without planning permission, be very confident of what you would achieve. You have to pay a price that reflects um, the ability to buy, build, to buy, construct, and leave a very big margin, a very decent margin uh, to, to make your profit. We're involved in six or seven different residential schemes, some of which will today make substantial profits, others are in the hands of the receiver and we're acting for the receiver and hopefully we'll either break even or make a small profit. But the, the, again, coming back to, is it profitable to buy a site in central London? The answer is it only relates to the purchase price. The art is in the buying. Um, what I wanted to ask, you are obviously a property guru and a well-known businessman, but do you have somebody you look up to? <laughs> There are many people in the property world who one looks up to. Um, for example, I look up to very much a gentleman by the name of Jonathan Goldstein, who is uh, the chairman of Kane International, and it's a multinational uh, property company which provides equity and debt. And I speak to him on a regular basis. Why do I look up to him? Because he's very precise, very accurate. He is black and white. And his answers, either his answer might be, I don't know, or he gives an answer, there are never a maybe. Another gentleman I look up to, who built up a huge company, is Gerald Ronson, who built up Heron. And uh, practically single-handedly working seven days a week, both in his garage business and his property business, has he, and he, oh, I'll give you a little example. Yes. Years ago, 
some years ago, my brother and I, 20 years ago, my brother and I wanted to develop a concept called data, uh, uh, called uh, um, data centers, data centers. And we went and saw Gerald Ronson, my brother and I, we asked him for his opinion. And he said, listen, I'm awfully sorry. I'm conflicted. I can't talk to you about it. I'm working with Michael Milken on a particular project. I'm conflicted. Three months later, eight o'clock in the morning, the phone rings. Mr. Ronson's on the phone. He says, listen, I'm no longer conflicted. Come and see me. And what he said was, high on services, low on rent, and then you'll win. And we were one of the few who managed to sell our data business to a very big uh, data center operator at a huge price, all because of Gerald Ronson's uh, advice and his willingness to talk to us. He's a person who, for example, if you phone him at eight o'clock in the morning, his secretary will say, but he's rather busy, he'll phone you back shortly. And by quarter past eight, you've got a call back from him. That's the type of man I admire. No, it's great. And the person does what he said he would do. It's, it's always good. But are you going to write your own book or me maybe memoirs or maybe property notes? That would be interesting, would be. Property notes. You can see them here. <laughs> the, ans the answer is, I've always thought about writing a, a, a life story, a story of my life in the property world, starting yeah. working with my late father, who was chairman of three public companies. Have I got the time? At the moment, I don't have time. And again, might be a little bit embarrassing. But my diaries, I write, I like to have handwritten notes and I write everything I have to do on one day on one page. And I barely have time to finish everything every day. So I end up staying away from working till two or three o'clock in the morning, most days. Perhaps I'm not as efficient as I should be. Okay, so we keep our fingers crossed that one day we will see your book uh, on the oh, show. Somebody will have to ghostwrite it <laughs> <with> me. <laughs> but anyway, um, we're now approaching the part of the show, which I like very much, where my guests get to tell me one fact or maybe a little secret from their life that not many people know. So your turn. Oh, thank you. I was hoping you were going to ask another guest. What secrets should I tell you? I can tell you some silly secrets. I love Marmite. <laughs> really? I never tried. You, never try, you may, may as well try the extra old Marmite, which is very hard to get. It's in a black bottle, a, bo a black jar, and it's the tastiest Marmite you can get. You know what I say about Marmite? Either you hate it or you love it. I've loved it all my life. I'm a very keen diver. My wife and I, who, as you know, is Russian, go diving very often. And we have dived in the Great Barrier Reef. We've dived in the Galapagos. We've dived in uh, all over the Caribbean. In, uh, we've dived in, the, the favorite dive I've ever been to is in the Maldives. Because once you get down to 32, 33 meters below the surface, the temperature is still the same, 31 degrees. Not oh. nice to dive or 15 degrees, I can tell you that. You have a fabulous life. I know that you are talking to us from uh, Marbella now. H how is the weather? <laughs> it's not as good as it was yesterday. Yesterday, the sea was deep blue and the sky was deep blue. Today, the sky is whitish gray and the sea is light gray. But it's actually been very nice and one can go out in one's shorts if one wants to. The weather is fine. People are very nice. They are very, very cautious here. Everybody wears a mask. There's a curfew at eight or nine o'clock in the evening, depending on where you are. All the restaurants are again closed, so we eat at home. Um, but the promenade by the beach, you can walk for miles. Um, and it's actually, and you can see on a clear day, you can see Africa. <laughs> oh, uh, well, I can't see Africa from Chelsea uh, here in London, and we have a rainy day today, surprise. Mm -hmm. how do, how to keep in a good spirit nowadays because it's a little bit uh you know it can be a little bit sad sometimes what what would be uh, your recommendation i have a nanny that sounds very strange but i have a lady who's 91 coming on 92 years old she brought me up she's been with me since i was less than three years old and i'm born in 1953 so she came in March or February 1956. She would say, get up, get on with it, work, 
make yourself active. Don't waste any time. And I've always found that when I'm working and I'm active, I am always positive. When I'm, when I'm on my own thinking and not working and just letting my mind wander, one becomes negative and one gets depressed. I think to overcome negativity, to overcome depression, to overcome worries, be active, work, do what you're good at doing, do especially what you like to do. Uh, thank you so much, Gary, for your time today. It's a pleasure yeah. talking to you. I and wish you, uh, you all the best and a great time uh, in uh, Marbella, good sales, and uh, I hope to see you at our business events very soon here in I London. Love invited. Thank you very much indeed. Thank Have a you lovely. very much. Bye-bye now.